Connections. I'm joined by Ruth Wedgwood in Washington. She is Director of International Law and Organizations Program at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. In New York, we have Thomas Weiss. He is Presidential Professor of Political Science at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. He's also author of What's Wrong with the United Nations and How to Fix It. And in Birmingham, we cross to Anis Atakriti. He is the CEO of the Cordoba Foundation. All right, folks, this is Crosstalk. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. But first, Masha, every time the United Nations is mentioned, it's never a dull moment. Especially when it comes to its flaws. One of the largest international organizations founded to facilitate world peace and uphold humanitarian causes, the United Nations has run up an ample record of criticism over its 66-year history. Bureaucratic inefficiency, failure to avert conflicts, as well as duplicity and disproportionate influence over decision-making are only a few of the charges being made against it. From the Darfur crisis to the genocide in Rwanda and the tragedy at Srebrenica, the organization has time and again allowed human atrocities to happen on its watch. Indeed, the UN's record reflects one shocking failure after another, even in the organization's earliest days. The UN's founders created a world body based on a noble idea, standing up to aggression, preserving international peace and defending human rights and other fundamental principles. But it is now clear that the UN simply doesn't work. The most striking example of what many see as an inherent flaw of the UN is the lack of proportionate representation at the Security Council, where power is most concentrated. Comprising five permanent members with veto rights, the Security Council is often accused of being selective in which issues it chooses to address, especially the recent votes on humanitarian intervention. To paraphrase George Orwell in Animal Farm, some civilians are more equal than others. Additionally, the newly emerging economic powers of the East and South are questioning whether the Security Council adequately reflects recent socioeconomic realities, where European countries have long ago lost their preeminent stature. UN detractors have long been calling to disband the world body for reasons of its relevance, yet the organization has been able to survive all criticism and perhaps not the least because of a lack of any better alternative. Back to you, Peter. Thank you very much for that, Marcia. Anis, if I can go to you first, um, what would be your most important contribution evaluating the value of the United Nations today? And I'm thinking all the way from the end of the Cold War to today, and I'm sure you'll mention something about Iraq. Well, I mean, there are, there's much to talk about, but let's go back to the very founding charter of the United Nations, we the people of the world, that very famous uh, line that set all this off. And let's talk about that charter and then compare it to where we are today and how much of that charter, with all its noble, high, quite esteemed, quite respectable um, aims and objectives, um, how much of those have actually been achieved, how much of them have actually been realized, and how much of them have actually contributed to creating a better, safer, more secure world, a world that takes a hundred times more than it used to before it embarks on war and, mm -hmm. uh, and violence and the such. And I think that if we were to compare, we'd find very little to compare with those words. And I think that that is the main problem. In terms of the organization itself, there's much, much, much to, to talk about. And I'm sure that your guest who's written a book about this will, will allude to these. But the problem is that the people of the world are bit by bit losing confidence in the body that is supposed to be actually speaking on their behalf before the powers of the world and not representing the military powers you know, uh, at the account and at the expense of the people of the world. All right, Thomas, that's a very interesting comment from Anis there. I mean, a lot of people say that the United Nations represents the interests of the rich, powerful Western countries and the countries that have an enormous amount of military power. And let's just look at Resolution 1973 and as it deals with uh, Libya. I mean, this is supposed to be a peacemaking body or keeping the peace. It seems more interested in violence these days. I certainly wouldn't uh, say that. Uh, 1973 was the first step toward uh, making leaders accountable, uh, thugs accountable for mistreating their people. The justification for that was clearly humanitarian. Uh, I certainly would distinguish that from what went on in Iraq. But the 1973 was a step toward uh, protecting civilians, exactly those people who figure in the ch Charter's preamble. Just to go back, um, I'm certainly someone who's thrown enough stones uh, at the institution over my analytical career. But I think it's intriguing uh, that in spite of all of the negative criticism of the body, that 
This week, uh, we have seen every uh, major head of state parade through. Uh, and last week, we saw uh, Netanyahu versus Abbas. So the circus actually serves some purpose. It's important to pull people together. And if it were not, why does everyone come to New York? Okay, very interesting. Ruth, well, if I can say with the, uh, the term circus, then it really was a circus because, you know, here's a country that wants its own independence and it's one country, the United States, that says no. The most of the vast majority of the world want to see the Palestinians have their own state, but no, one country can say, no, it's not going to happen. Go back and do your homework type of thing. Is that democratic? Is that fair? Is that what this institution was supposed to be all about when it was founded in 1945? Well, I, I know you want your guests to quarrel, so okay. I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I think you'll discover that, that Tom Weiss and I are more like-minded on this than you would ever suppose. Okay. Uh, I mean, what one, one purpose of, or at least one, one very ben beneficial side effect of having this locus in New York is that the many countries in the world that can't afford to have diplomatic missions all over the world. Fair enough. Because there are a lot of countries, 193 countries, and, and you couldn't, if you're a small, poor country, have a mission in every other country. So it actually serves as a substitute for bilateral relationships with a lot of countries. Um, the Palestinian question is very complicated, as you know. There's a debate about the roadmap process and what was supposed to be uh, security issues and other vital issues in the last stage of that. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the Arab Spring has uh, ignited new forces and emotions that formerly might have been more content to wait. Um, I do think that there is something to be said for the circus quality in that every uh, criminal head of state in the world who is still in office gets to come <laughs> with complete absolute immunity every September. So you do have some real rogues coming to town in New York like Ahmadinejad and they do use the the event to uh, good effect for showing their flamboyance, whether it was Gaddafi before camping out oh, okay. in New Jersey. Okay, well, Ruth, I mean, can't, can't you turn that upside down and say it's a level playing field? Maybe that's one virtue of the United Nations Secu uh, General Assembly is that everybody can show up. I mean, just because they're, you're, they're a rogue, they're a rogue for whom, okay? And if I can go back to you, again, I mean, how democratic is the, is the United Nations? Because this is the era now of democracy, the Arab Spring. Everyone should have the same values. They should be able to go vote, they should have civil society, they should have their uh, authorities hold them to accountability. But is that really the fact? Because again, you have a small number of countries that can say, put a, a block on everything. Does that need to change? Well, just going back to, um, to the statement made that it's the only circus in town, it may be so, but that is not uh, saying much. Uh, simply because most countries in the world don't have another platform on, on which to be on that, as you put it, Peter, the, the, the level playing field. Um, I, I, I think we ought to address the realities. And the reality is that in terms of democracy, it, there is very, very little that is practiced in the United Nations. And with all due respect, Ruth, I, I, you know, uh, I, I think that as much as you can talk about Ahmadinejad being rogue, I think there are many, many more, including Netanyahu himself. I think that one of the problems of the United Nations uh, is the fact that the, the many resolutions that it passed, and particularly in the case of Israel, were never taken on board, were never, uh, never adhered to. And therefore, the question that comes and poses itself is really how, how much worth does the United Nations pose? How much power does it pose? When the United States and the United Kingdom, my own country, when they wanted to go to war on Iraq, when they felt that it couldn't be done through the United Nations Security Council because of a veto from France and, and, and other countries, they just went it alone and they bypassed the United Nations and the United Nations could do nothing whatsoever. So it may be a talk shop and it may be a talk shop where certain small countries can feel their worth for that particular five or ten minutes that their leader speaks. But in reality, in terms of influence and power, they have none whatsoever. What do you think about that, Thomas, when you, the great powers have no use for the world body? They just say, well, well, we'll go on our own and there's good, and they can do it with impunity. Well, the question is, uh, why did the United States and the United Kingdom go to the Security Council in the first place? There would have been an additional legitimacy had the Security Council uh, approved their going to war. They did not. That is the way the charter was written, so that the major powers have a bigger voice. And in fact, uh, the Security Council, or the UN in general, was damned if it didn't, uh, that is, control the United States and Britain. And in the United States and Britain, or at least in certain government circles, it was damned because the United Nations didn't make Saddam Hussein behave. 
uh, the United Nations is only as strong as the states who are part of it, who decide to do something, and the major powers have a bigger voice than the smaller powers. That's the rules. That's the way it's always operated. That's the way it'll always operate. Well, well, is that good enough, Ruth? Is that good enough in the day and age of where everyone should have a, a voice and, and have, have legitimacy because they are right, not just because they're powerful? Well, I, I certainly do agree with Tom that the Security Council's regime at least makes major powers come to New York to talk about whether force should be used. So if you think kind of uh, moral, intellectual engagement is worth something, the UN usually does fill that role fairly successfully. But I would disagree with the assertion that, that small powers are weak. I, I have my own differences with how the General Assembly operates. It operates in clacks and cliques. It operates in groups that actually often decide the issue before they get to the General Assembly. But the South, the Group of 77, as it's called, it's really 132 countries. It's the supermajority of the General Assembly. It can pass any resolution it wants to without a veto. So the South actually has an enormous voice in the UN. Sometimes that's a problem, because when the SG, the Secretary General, wants to reform a personnel system or redeploy money, uh, he, he always has to try to lobby the GA. And that's a okay, Ruth, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to bodies. a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the United Nations. Stay with RT.